welcome to Artifacts, the uh, City Cable 34 show on the arts in Minneapolis. In a little bit, we'll have two guests, Carolyn Bay and Diane Herman, who are consulting with the City of Minneapolis on Culture Talk, checking out what's really uh, the potential for working with the city and the arts. But my first guest is Lois Holton, who is a choreographer, a dancer, and an artist. Lois, it's great to have you on the show. Oh, thank you. It's very nice to be on the show. I'm no dancer, though. You Not certainly anymore. have danced. Well, yes, I have. Sure. I think most people in Minneapolis would remember the Nutcracker for over 20 years at Northrop Auditorium. The good news is that you're going to do it again, but this year it's going to be at the State Theater downtown Minneapolis. Yes, I helped produce the Nutcracker Fantasy last winter at the State Theater in January, and everyone was very shocked by its success. But the State Theater is so beautiful and such an asset to the city of Minneapolis, the inner city, that I just had to perform on it. I've always thought it was a good place to see dance in particular. Oh, it's a good place to see everything. I love the vibrations. You know, you go into the lobby and it's so exciting. Theater, live theater is about to begin. And it has a history. You feel the vibrations of all the wonderful people that have probably trod those boards. That's exciting to me. That's right. And you can feel it. Well, I feel it all the time. I used to feel it at Northrop Auditorium. But the most exciting thing about coming back with the Nutcracker Fantasy is to renew friendships with David Hislop, with whom I worked with the Minnesota Orchestra for many years uh, when he was with the orchestra. And he's back again. And the orchestra, it's just wonderful for everyone to work with other consummate artists. And they're playing the music, you're yep. choreographing. And this is in November, next month. No, it's in December. I'm, I beg your pardon, it's uh, uh -huh. December at the State Theater. It's definitely Christmas. That's right. And when does it open? Do you know the date? Yep, December 10th. Okay. And, it and then we go for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Saturday, Sunday, that weekend, and then we also do it the next weekend. So we've right. almost hit Christmas Eve. Yeah, just up to the date. Now, you mentioned you self-produce. Why is that? What is it about self-production that uh, you needed to choose well, that? Well, I was fired in 1986. And we had performed the Nutcracker for about 23 years, 22 of them with the Minnesota Orchestra. It was wonderful. And there was a real collaboration on the local scene. I felt that was vital and important. And I think in the 1980s, late 1970s, the arts began to change. You know, they began to shift. I think vision didn't count as much as the net worth on the audit sheet. And. Um, about three years later, I had many, many people ask for the Nutcracker Fantasy, and I thought, what made it survive? I mean, what about the people? Are the people the killers of the poet's dream? I mean, in my case, were they the killers? Or do the people determine what perseveres, what endures? Is endurability via destruction the rule of thumb in today's arts process? So I decided to put on a skimp nutcracker, and I got some of the sets. Now, when I was fired, the board of directors sold all of my sets and costumes so I, and threw away the archives and so forth. So I was literally so, sort of denuded. I had nothing. So you had to start from scratch. Oh, from scratch is right. But I decided I would use the term skimp, which is like a t-shirt because I was making costumes out of t-shirts for $5.95 from Target local. And uh, so I did a skimp Nutcracker Fantasy in January, and it sold out. People loved it. So when the State Theater started being renovated, I went over there one day because Fred Crone's a friend of mine, and it was so beautiful and breathtaking. I said, would you let me do the Nutcracker Fantasy here? Five performances. He said, yep, you have it. So we had no orchestra, couldn't afford that or anything. But we brought the sets from the people who had purchased them and rented the costume, my old costumes, and got it all together. And we produced it at the State Theater. And it was a hit. And you're doing it again. And David Hislop came. Mm -hmm. And he said, how about doing it with the Minnesota Orchestra? So mm -hmm. here I am. Well, now, we've talked earlier, you and I, about the need to keep culture in the city. And you've traveled a lot. You've seen yes. a lot of other cities in this country. And you've been abroad as well. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about what it means to try and keep culture in the city and what happens when it doesn't stay in a city? Well, in the first place, in most of my travels, the inner city has been dead, except for one area, and that's a cultural corridor. Many cities got together and did like uh, we've done here to the State Theater. They've 
recovered and renovated the Orpheum theaters and the Schubert theaters and all the theaters that have existed throughout the um, country. And they have made it available to their opera, to their theater, to their musical comedy, to their dance, and to their orchestral and choral associations. So many of the places, like let's say Tulsa, Oklahoma, Seattle because of the World's Fair, Omaha, uh, they have kept those cultural corridors very alive with activity, but they also represent the city and the area from which they come. And then, of course, they supplement this with traveling road shows and so forth. But the major thrust is for the citizens who represent the arts from the, in the city, in the center cultural corridor from which all of these things emanate. It's so exciting. But for example, in Omaha, uh, we stayed at the Red Lion Inn. Very difficult to find any stores, any availabil availabilities for purchase, let's say of makeup and so forth. You have to go out to the mall. So other than maybe culture, the, the, inner, the, the downtown areas of the many cities are just... The downtown area is dead. I'm talking about Louisville, Kentucky. I'm talking about, you know, cities that... Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about many of your major cities and... Uh, and how would you compare Minneapolis to some of these other places like Louisville or Omaha? Well, Minneapolis is a miracle because it has a wonderful inner city. Oh, I'd hate to think of losing it. I just think the cultural scene should be more active and dynamic than ever. I think arts, some, something like dance and theater and so forth, they're energizing. They use all of that tremendous energy and vision that the young people have, and that's what we have to do. Utilize that energy that's part of their nature, part of their spirit. And you've talked about the art, all the arts really, coming from the street. Where, where do you get your inspiration? Where do you see art? And I know you've been on top of issues that other folks hadn't even seen yet, and you've put it on stage in your dances over the years. Well, I've been lucky enough to be asked to do my art in all of these cities. So I only know them from a cultural standpoint or from what I can envision in uh, the, living in the inner city. It's not easy going to all of the country and the cities and living alone in the motel right in the inner city and know you can't go, you really can't go out at night alone mm -hmm. because there aren't the restaurants, there aren't the, um, the bistros, there aren't the, fun cafes and everything that Minneapolis has. I mean, you just sort of sit so in your room. So somehow it all works here. It all works, and Minneapolis has to keep it working. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it has to keep the city streets safe. And I think if we could only utilize physical and energetic um, sports areas, workout areas, dancing areas, um, study areas, arts areas. Activate it. Minneapolis is incredible from the inner city standpoint yet. But we know that there are many troubling moments, especially when you put on television in the morning and the first thing you hear about is who was killed last night Yeah. and where. It's a sad way to wake up. I want to get into some tapes you brought of some of the dances. Yes. And they're going to put it up on the screen for us now. We can take a look at it and maybe describe to our viewers what they're seeing. Now, these are dances that you've choreographed over the years. Yes. And I think it's coming up right now. What is it that we're looking at? From Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, and danced by two beautiful dancers who were part of the Minnesota Dance Theater in the fateful year of 1986. And, uh, they now are in the Milwaukee Ballet, but they come every summer to dance for me in my July concerts. They're beautiful, Evie and Willie Shives. And of course, I first met them and choreographed for them in Austin, Texas. Well, that's Just to you give met. you an idea of the national I had no idea about aspect of, of my work. Now you mentioned your July performances. Where is it that you do that? Yes, well, in my old studio. Uh, I've always been in old Masonic buildings. The Masons were incredible. They not only helped us with Mozart, but they always gave that vibration. They built social halls, and they were always two stories high, so you can do lifts and turns and leap, 
you know, for the ceiling. And I've been in three Masonic temples in the history of my life here in Minneapolis. Hennepin nice. Center for the Arts mm -hmm. was the third and last one I went in. And now that, of course, contains dance studios that we developed originally and now is used for other uh, dance schools. So it's still alive and, and it doesn't quite yet have the vibrations I remember as we went into it. But I hope it will have. Boyce, what did we just see here? I think they're just finishing. And now we see a parada wingborn. This is a parada I developed at the death of my first benefactress, Markel Brooks. And since I developed it, it took the dance world by storm and was called the Grand Parada of the 20th century. And it's been performed in elegy for many, many people. And of late, it's being performed as an elegy for AIDS of dancers who have passed away. And for me, that's a beautiful thought. It was danced as an elegy for George Balanchine, one of the famous artists in America from Russia, and for Walter Terry, a critic, and for Jean Dolly, local people. And it's been danced all over the world. In Mexico, they think I'm Indian. In Japan, they think I'm Oriental. And in Dance Theater of Harlem, they think I'm black. So what better reputation could you have and that they can't quite tell when they see it who I am. And this is Poem for October, a, uh, a dance I created this July, and it was a new dance done to the music of John Corigliano, whom people heard in the Metropolitan Opera, Ghosts of Versailles, and a wonderful young composer, mm. beautiful, and I used his music. And very fitting that this show is airing in October. Thank you for yeah, uh, creating something. Yeah, I love something. October. It's a wonderful month it here. It is nice. Well, Lois, I think we're uh, just about out of time. I'd love to have you come back and talk about art in the cities and art with young people. Maybe you can come back another time and we'll talk further about some of I'd things. love it because young people is where it's at. They have to provide the mirror for who we are. And before we go, the Nutcracker, December 10th. Tenth State with the Theater. Minnesota Orchestra at the State Theater. And oh, be sure you know we're the city's own, the Minnesota Dance Theater. Boys, thanks a lot for being on the show. Oh, you're welcome. We'll talk Thank again. You. We'll be back in just a moment with our second segment, but first, take a look at this interesting art fact. Welcome back. I found that to be an interesting fact about the Sculpture Garden myself. Culture Talks is the name of an inquiry by the city of Minneapolis uh, into what the role of the city and the arts in the city can be. And to that end, two consultants have been hired to uh, take a serious and disciplined look at that. And I'm uh, happy to have both of them here with me today in this show. Carolyn Bai and Diane Herman, welcome. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Glad Bill. you could be Good here. To see you. And we're going to get into some specifics, but I'm wondering if maybe you could start with just a quick description of what Culture Talks, which is the name of it, what that's about and what you're intending to do. Sure. Culture Talks is uh, a wonderful opportunity um, funded by the Dayton Hudson Foundation, a very generous grant from, from the foundation, um, to enable the city to take, I'm not sure it's totally serious and disciplined at all times, but to take a fairly systematic look at what it is that the city does um, to, in terms of interaction with the, the many arts and cultural activities in this community. And as we all know, uh, Minneapolis uh, is known for the richness of its arts and cultural community. Um, but no one has really systematically looked at how city government impacts arts and culture. Um, so what this project does is gives us the, uh, the ability to to take a look at um, what it is that the city does. And as we have taken a preliminary look, we see that there are many, many agencies. There are um, in excess of 15 city governmental agencies which have 
uh, impact on arts and culture in the community. Um, so we can pull together an understanding of what it is that we do. Our sense is that um, this, it's somewhat fragmented and not really well understood. So one of the, the objectives is to understand what is it that we do. Uh, and secondly, and very importantly, uh, go out into the community and ask the question, how are we doing? It's a pretty fundamental question. It's asked um, you know, every day by, uh, you know, by businesses and also many nonprofit organizations. Um, and a real healthy question for government to be asking as well. Um, and so we plan to go out and using a variety of techniques, uh, focus groups, interviews, um, larger community meetings, um, ask the question, you know, how are we doing? Should we make changes? Is there a need for city government to change in some way um, how it affects arts and cultural programs? And that coincidentally, there is a phone <laughs> number that people interested in getting in touch yes. with both of you can call. Do you want to rattle that number right. off right now and we'll probably do it again <laughs> later? Sure. We are inviting um, as broad a level of, of uh, public participation as we can in this project. Um, and we have a Culture Talks phone number, which is 474-2607. Uh, we encourage you to call us at any time with any of your thoughts on the subject, any ideas, suggestions you may have. Um, we're uh, actively uh, publicizing the phone number, our address. Uh, we hope that, that you'll uh, initiate a, uh, any kind of contact, whether it be a letter or whatever. Um, in addition, and importantly, when I talked about the focus groups and the in-depth interviews and the, and the community meetings that Carolyn and I have are in the process of planning, over the course of the next six months, our goal is to uh, receive information, receive opinions and ideas from at least a thousand people in the arts and cultural community. Pretty good sample of uh, uh, opinion from <laughs> right. That's our city. goal. Yeah. Whether it be you know whether it be um, organizations which produce present arts programs, uh, or or whether it be uh, people who uh, benefit in so many ways from the uh, from the programs that are out there. Carolyn, when we talk about art culture. <laughs> pretty broad, broad topic here in Minneapolis, uh, and we're really blessed, as we're just saying, with lots of art. I mean, uh, you can hardly shake a stick at it. What are you looking at? Where, what corners are you going into? Who are you going to kind of bring under the umbrella and talk about? I'm glad you asked that. Um, we view the, the term of arts and culture very broadly, and we're not only going to be talking to the people who are directly producing art um, as artists or administrators or people involved with m the more formal organizations. But we're also talking with people in the community whose neighborhoods are having arts projects and churches who get involved in arts projects, as well as the consumer, the person who um, just simply believes that the arts are important to them and to their community, whether they participate themselves or whether they uh, participate by driving by a sculpture that's on their, the street going into their neighborhood. Um, but we're looking at very broadly defining the arts and, and how, how the city can more effectively make certain that the arts continue to be such an important part of our lives. And I did happen to just bring along today an example in, in this morning's paper. There was a wonderful article, and I don't know how well you can see it, but the, um, the article is about murals that a group of young people were doing in the Phillips neighborhood on the sides of buildings. And Hold that up for another second here, maybe they can get the, a um, good shot on the it. The thing that I loved about the article is that this is what a big piece of what we're talking about when we talk about the arts in our community. Uh, I want to interrupt for a quick second. The juxtaposition mm -hmm. here of the murals help youths picture a better world, right next to a story about a very tragic situation here with some young kids in a game that turns deadly. Positive al uh, alternative mm -hmm. for kids to get involved right. in. Tougher luck here. Well, I think of the, uh, the stories we've seen um, recently about the, uh, the shooting of the policeman um, in South Minneapolis. Uh, it's, it's, I think one of the things that we're seeing as we, as we look at the, way, the various ways that government can use the arts um, in a positive way um, is that many communities are using the arts as a way to address social issues. Um, and certainly the stress 
the stresses in this community, the stresses in many of our neighborhoods. There are, this is one example, and there are countless examples. As we look at the kinds of things the city is doing uh, in the neighborhood arts programs, countless ways that we're using the arts very constructively um, to help people cope with the changes that are occurring um, in our city. To bring, we're bringing communities together. Yes. I, th I think that mural project is a really good example of what Diane mm -hmm. is saying, that the, it both the kids who participated, their learning went far beyond how to put paint on a wall effectively. Um, and they got into many other issues using art as the basis. And then the product of what they did has incredible value to the people both in their community as well as any of us who drive by that community and those buildings and get to see what the, the young people produced. I think what Lois was talking about just before us is, is exactly right. The arts in this community are incredibly vibrant and incredibly important in the very fabric of what we, how we relate to each other and how our community functions. And so really what Culture Talks is about doing is to help to capture that, both in terms of what we're already doing, the city, what the city is doing, what the people in the communities want, um, and how best to be able to do that. So we're not only asking the arts community, what do you need the city to be able to do? We're asking the person on the street, why are the arts important? And we want to hear that. Well, now, you've mentioned, and Lois earlier mentioned, the, the richness of the arts in Minneapolis. And I suppose to some degree we take that a little bit for granted, and this is a good opportunity to take a look at it. You've both been in the community long enough within the arts world and in the broader world in, in business and social life. What is it about Minneapolis, the Twin Cities, that has engendered so much art culture? Are we that different, as Lois mentioned, from Omaha and Louisville and Atlanta? What do you mm -hmm. think from your personal perspectives and backgrounds? Well, there, I think there are a lot of theories, and, and probably there are many, many factors that contribute to, to it. It didn't happen overnight. It's a, you know, a long history of certainly uh, a high level of support on the part of um, our major corporations and, and our foundations, very generous philanthropic community that is, has uh, fostered this. Um, I, I think that it's, it's, it's uh, easier to talk about what is and how we compare than it is to talk about why it happens to be this way. Um, and if you look at the numbers, um, it's very clear that today, um, Minneapolis, uh, on many, many measures, um, on a per capita basis, um, has the highest level of artistic acti activity um, in this country. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition to having you know, the, the most, the largest number of theaters, the largest number of musical groups, the largest you know, audience, uh, audiences, and so on and so on, all those measures. In addition to that, um, the Minneapolis community and the Twin Cities community, um, we need to think a little more broadly when we talk about the arts community, certainly. Uh, the Twin Cities area is, is the home of some of the absolute jewels um, of their kind. Um, jewels in theater, um, nationally known in, in, um, in uh, the publishing industry, certainly, and, uh, and many other categories. Minneapolis is not only known for its high level, but also for its very special uh, organizations that are internationally known mm -hmm. in their field. Okay. Um, it often surprises people that we have a very strong science fiction community here, or mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. sort of classic American ballroom dance community and things. And th It's mm -hmm. like layers of the onion. You can sometimes pick things up and do that. Yeah. You mentioned the 15 or so city agencies that one way or another you've discovered are involved mm -hmm. with the arts or culture, broadly speaking. And I suppose the general viewer would be thinking of the parks. They certainly do a lot of programming. Mm -hmm. There's an arts commission. Um, but I'll bet some would be a, a surprise. Have you uh, found any surprises so far in your digging? I know you've really just started this process, but any um, mm -hmm. surprises that you've seen or, or questions that haven't been raised uh, prior well, to this? Well, I think some of the, just to speak to what some of the agencies or roles are, um, it's not only, what we've been trying to capture is how does the work of various agencies also affect the arts? So yes, the Park Board has art, arts programs in the community. That one's pretty clear. But the decisions that the tax assessor makes have direct implications for many arts organizations. The permits that are issued for, for independent artists, for organizations who want to do special events, 
uh, for uh, the potter who wants to build a kiln in their yard. Uh, all of those kinds of issues which can be either helpful to uh, helping the arts to thrive or can kind of put their thumb on how art is able to just simply continue and to flourish are part of what the city in defining its relationship to the arts w wants to define. Um, but we have a film and recording office that helps uh, productions when they come into the community and brings an enormous amount of money into the community. We have, we deal with heritage preservation and buildings and uh, the planning of both city buildings and communities and how they're built. And so it, it's very intertwined. And I think there are a lot of things that we don't think of initially that, that oh yeah, that would affect um, uh, uh, an individual artist who needs to have a, um, a space to do a certain kind of work mm -hmm. that would affect um, whether or not that person could do their work depending on how rules and regulations are made. So a, a part of that will be to, to look to the artists in the community and say, what are some ways that you have been helped by the city or that you've tried to do and that you found that it frustrating to figure out who could help you to answer some of those questions? Now, I know one of the reasons mm -hmm. you as a team were hired is that you have backgrounds in demographics and business relations and that. You must have um, sort of an ongoing finger to the pulse of demographic changes. I mean, something you just mentioned, Carolyn, made me think of that, that uh, as our population is aging across the country and locally, and more folks are working at home, and you mentioned the zoning and people may be wanting to work at home, uh, that implies a change in the relationship of them to their work the public sector and the arts. Um, any sense out there, not just on the arts, but big changes that might be affecting this uh, quantitative and, and lush art scene? I mean, yes it is, we've, we've got a great thing here. What are some of the factors that are going to influence it and affect it in the next well, couple of years? Well, clearly one of the things that you hear in the arts community, the producing arts community, is what's happening to funding. And where they have gotten their funding traditionally and how some of those funding sources are shrinking. So uh, there is not an arts organization that uh, functions as an institution that is not close to in agony at this point. Uh, they're either currently facing big financial questions about how they can operate in the future, or they soon will be. Um, so that, I mean, that is clearly one, one large piece. Another is that our tax bases are changing and the city demographics are changing. Uh, who has traditionally supported the arts from the individual community is changing. As you said, as the community ages, um, there are different populations now as our community is becoming more diverse who have different interests and needs in the arts that also need to be expressed and find an avenue for them being able to have their work seen and appreciated by a broader community. Sounds like a lot of big issues as well as some very specific yeah, ones. Right. Ladies, we've got to get going. The end of this segment comes all too all right. fast. Great. Once again, that number, if people want to get in touch with yes. Culture Talks. Please, please uh, feel free to call us. Um, we'll set up a time to, uh, to hear your concerns. Um, the number is 474-2607. Okay, thanks very much for being on the show. Thank you. Great. Look forward to being in touch. Fun. Thanks. Great. And if you have general questions about what you've seen or heard on this show, call the City Cable 34 hotline. 673-2234 and stay tuned for a quick calendar of events in Minneapolis. We'll see you next time. I'm Phil Lindsay.
Hello and welcome to Artifacts, the monthly show on City Cable 34 in which we talk about the arts and what's going on in Minneapolis. Later on we're going to have a teacher and some young people involved with the City Children's Nutcracker Project, a really exciting thing uh, that's going on next month here in Minneapolis. But first I've got two guests that I'm very eager to talk about, uh, the American Asian Renaissance Project and a couple of specific forums that they've got coming up and we'll talk about some of those details. But first I want to welcome Ken Choi. Thanks. Welcome. Thanks for being Thanks here. And Karen Muckenhern. Thanks. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Glad to have you both here. Thank you. Could we start maybe just talking about what's coming up early uh, this month, November, uh, while the show's airing? Uh, there's a forum going on about theater arts. Can you talk a little bit about that? Right. Basically, the Playwright Center and the Asian American Renaissance is sponsoring a theater forum on Asian American theater. And some of the panelists will be Ping Chong, um, Rick Shiomi, who's a noted uh, Asian American playwright, um, Jacqueline Kim of the Guthrie Acting Company, and um, Ken Choi and myself. <laughs> That's right, you're a, you're a playwright yourself. <laughs> yes, I am. Um, and um, basically, like I said, we're going to discuss Asian American theater, and um, it hopes to be a very heated discussion. <laughs> <laughs> no, you say that, and so there must be some issues underlying uh, the well, discussion. In there's certainly different viewpoints in Asian American theater, um, um, and I hope we'll attack those and definitely point those out. Okay, now some of the names may be familiar to theater goers here in the Twin Cities. I know I've seen works by Ping Chong at right. Illusion Theater over right. the years. Um, a couple of you, maybe including yourself, are Playwright Fellows, am I right about that? Yeah, I'm a Jerome Fellow at the okay. Playwright Center. Um, so I've been here all of, working on four months. So, so you came to Minneapolis, what, just this summer? Yeah. And where did you come from? I came here from the West Coast, from LA. Okay. <laughs> and what uh, drew you here? Was it the fellowship? Yeah, it was a fellowship. That's nothing else that drew me here. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were kidding earlier. You have yet to experience one of our Minnesota winners. Absolutely, so. and I'm flying back to California <laughs> as, as soon as I can. So, <laughs> I so okay. <laughs> and Karen, this particular forum is part of a series of events that uh, the Asian American Renaissance mm -hmm. is putting together. Can you talk about the Renaissance effort and what's going on with sure. that? Sure. Um, it started early last year. Um, a small group of grassroots uh, individuals came together to um, start planning uh, an arts conference, uh, which actually happened last May. And um, it was about a four or five day conference. And um, it involved performance art, visual art, um, a lot of panel discussions about different issues in the Asian American communities and um, had poetry and fiction writers. So it's all um, the disciplines are involved, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, we try to include um, as many disciplines as possible. Mm -hmm. What generated that conference? What, what in what, 1991, 1992 made some folks decide, hey, now it's time to get this effort off the ground? Um, I think it was mainly that um, a few individuals saw that um, um, Asian American artists in the Twin Cities area were really growing. Like there, uh, there were a growing number of Asian American artists, and they didn't see the community as connected enough in order to um, encourage these artists, especially young people, um, to keep going along in what they did. So they figured if they um, got together this grassroots uh, group of people, um, that they could form a conference um, within the community itself um, in order to foster uh, the arts for Asian Americans. So how's here. the response been? Um, lots of it's folks getting involved. It's been great, involved yeah, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think when they started it, they didn't realize how many people would actually end up um, attending the meetings and participating. Because um, I think it grew to, I think we're about 50 or 60 people now. Um, and it just started with a couple people. Is it, uh, how formal is it? Is it pretty much a steering committee and you break into different work groups? How do you, how do you organize yourselves? Yeah, it's, it's fairly informal because everybody's working on a volunteer basis and everybody, mm -hmm. everybody has other things that they're doing. Um, we try and meet every three weeks and... Um, with food. Yeah. That's always important. That's Hot always lux. important. Especially <laughs> for those folks from the West Coast that need to come in. Absolutely. <laughs> and... Um, Valerie Lee is pretty much a director, and David Mora is the artistic director. Mm -hmm. And um, they lead the meetings, and then we do break off into different committees. Okay, well in a moment, Ken, I'd like to talk a little bit about what you do yourself, a playwright, performance artist, right. uh, from what you said. Right. But I thought we might talk a little bit about the places that viewers of this show might see or hear 
some of the Asian American artists that are working in Minneapolis. Now you mentioned David Murrah, who's probably one of the more familiar names, I may be wrong about that. Right. Um, he's mm -hmm. had great success with some of his books of poetry, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, not infrequently he'll be mentioned at a reading that the Loft might be doing or elsewhere, book mm -hmm. signings or whatever. Mm -hmm. Where are people able to come and see um, Asian American artists uh, on stage or with an exhibition or whatever they're doing? Well, um, there's, um, like oh, well, she just mentioned, the cabaret that we're sponsoring, also co-sponsoring with the Playwright Center. And it's a monthly cabaret hosted by David Moran and myself. And basically, it's um, geared for the emerging artists as well as the established artists to really try some material out and um, um, have a good time, I hope. <laughs> um, basically, there's also a theater called uh, Theater Moo, which is headed by Dong Yeo Lee and Rick Xiaomi and Martha Johnson. And um, they're starting to emerge as at the forefront of Asian American theater. Now the cabaret, just so that our viewers might be able to right. get a, an idea on that, that's coming later this month in November. Right, that's on the 21st of November at the Playwright Center. Okay, and, and that's over on East Franklin. East Franklin, 23rd and Franklin. And um, do you have a phone number they could get more information? Absolutely, it's 646-3408. Uh, one more time, 646-3408. <laughs> and tell somebody who's been on stage around. Yeah. Well, now, you, you came out of Southern California. Right. You're a playwright, performance artist. What kind of work do you do? Does it particularly have Asian American themes, or do you do any theme that comes into your own heart or your mind? Well, or I what? deal a lot with Asian American themes and uh, gay and lesbian themes, um, people who are disenfranchised from society's um, structures. Um, and actually, I just completed my one-man show at the Minneapolis Theater Garage called Buzz Off Butterfly. Oh, that was your show. How was that received? Did you get it? It was really well received. I'm really happy. Actually, I didn't expect to do my show here um, because <laughs> I didn't think there was a big Asian population in Minnesota. But when I came here, um, I found out that there was an Asian American Renaissance in David Murray. And, mm -hmm. and, um, that's why I'm enjoying it. So that was life. in addition to your fellowship. I mean, you came directly for right. that and then found these other efforts Absolutely. that Karen and, and folks Absolutely. Were the day after I arrived, um, no less than 18 hours, I was taken to an Asian American Renaissance meeting. And, and from then, you know, I thought I would have some time off after my road trip here um, and stopping over at Las Vegas. But um, it didn't happen. I'm still working, working you hard. Working hard. That's good. Can you talk a little bit about some of the things that you're doing that we might be able to see here either this month or um, coming up? Let's see. I think I have a performance at the university with my one man show. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, Buzz Off Butterfly. And um, Describe that a little bit if you would. What, what's Buzz in that? Buzz Off Butterfly um, is basically about a person who chooses insanity. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's about a performance artist called Ken Michael Chow. Um, big difference between myself and him. <laughs> um, and um, he goes home and tries to or tries to deal with his emotional and psychological past. Okay, sounds interesting. Yeah, uh, um, I hope to bring it back to Minnesota. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, w you alluded to some of the issues that the upcoming forum mm -hmm. um, held at the Playwright Center might get into. Do you want to elaborate, either of you, on some of those uh, issues? Um, well, I think um, the state of Asian American theater, since there's three Asian American theaters companies um, uh, major in the United States, in San Francisco, um, Los Angeles, and uh, New York, and um, all three companies are having to go multicultural, and, um, uh, and then we're also dealing with Miss Saigon, the issue with Miss Saigon and... Are you uh, referring to the casting in that? I know casting, that was a big issue. Right. Yeah. That was a very big issue for mm -hmm. the Asian American theater. We're also dealing with um, the Minnesota Opera um, Madame Butterfly production in next year. So Same kind of issue with the casting and all? Absolutely. Or? Well, not or the, so or much the as the selection. casting, but the selection of... Um, what they plan to do. Well, it, not to pick on any particular group, but when issues like that come up, do you make a, a, a contact, a relationship with the producer or the company? Uh, in the, well, in that issue, yeah, we are. You are. And, and we're mm -hmm. creating dialogue. Okay. Um, I want to get back to Karen mm -hmm. with a couple of broader questions, but um, while we've got you here, and, and I love to do this when we have visitors in from other parts of the country, mm -hmm. What has your impression been of the, the Twin Cities, the Minneapolis art scene, mm -hmm. whether particularly in your field or just in general? I mean, how would you compare or contrast it to what you are temporarily coming from in Los well, Angeles? Um, as far as Asian Americans, I think, um, because of the Asian American th uh, Renaissance and because of Theater Moo, um, I think um, the Asian American theater 
um, is burgeoning here. It's, it's really emerging as a strong force as opposed to um, LA, where there's a lot of backbutting and competition. So I think within it's the healthy. community, you're absolutely. Saying, yeah. um, um, there's different factions, but here we're all starting out, so we're we're all pulling for each other. Could that be partly a function of size too? That when you get more people within a community, there are more factions that build, or it depends. It depends it's on what structures are created. Okay. Yeah. Well, and that actually ties right in with my next question, mm -hmm. Karen. If there is one that you could share, what kind of historical background locally here in the Twin Cities has there been for Asian American art? Um, I know as a young person, one of the great thrills was to see Randall Duck Kim uh, over at the Guthrie, for instance, and see his acting. And then he went down to um, Spring Green, where I think he's still very involved down there with that theater company. But other than that, I have to plead ignorance and not know mm -hmm. in terms of Asian American issues, what's been going on here in Minneapolis? Any context that you could put it in for us? Hmm. Um. Well, I know that one of the reasons why um, the Renaissance was formed, because a lot of people thought that there were um, Asian American artists around the community, but they were all working separately, like, like mm -hmm. there was no um, communication between the groups. And I guess I don't know specifically about the history um, okay. in the area. Okay. But well, I know that that was one of the issues. Right, a, a, um, a sense of needing to come together. And I think that's right. usually the first thing we need to do is let each other know we're here and, mm -hmm. and do that. Sounds like you had some great opportunities for collaboration and then working. Yeah. And the Playwright Center has been very supportive, it sounds like. Absolutely, very supportive mm -hmm. um, individually and with the Asian American Renaissance. Now this month, there's the early, uh, on the 4th of November is the um, forum. forum. And I think you mentioned the 20th. First, the first is the cabaret. Is the cabaret. What else is coming up? We've got just a minute or so um, as the winter comes on. Are there mm -hmm. other plans, Karen? The um, we're planning for um, a big traditional dance concert um, in the fall of 93 and maybe one in the spring of 94 also. And right now we're in the midst of planning for another big conference um, in the spring of 94, um, which will be similar to the one in 1992. Yeah, this past May. The past one that just happened. And yeah. It sounds very successful and yeah. up mm -hmm. and, and at them. <laughs> That's good. Great. Any last thoughts? Mm -hmm. Words of wisdom <laughs> for the Twin <laughs> Cities audience? Well, um, if there, anybody's interested in joining or um, coming to events, they can call the number that's listed um, that okay. I talked about before and should be on the screen. Um, <laughs> sure. And, Why don't you um, hold up just okay. briefly here what you got? I think this is the logo for yeah. the uh, American, I'm sorry, the Asian American Renaissance Forums. Right. And uh, as you said, people can call that number. And I know Absolutely. in the calendar at the end of this show, we'll talk specifically about the forum, okay. which ha is happening uh, the 4th. Great. So I want to thank you both for coming on. Thank you. We'll Thanks keep in touch. Good luck. Absolutely. Thanks, Thanks a lot for having us. Well, we'll be back in a moment with some folks from the City Children's Nutcracker. But first, take a look at this interesting fact about the arts. And welcome back. In this part of the show, I'm very excited to have some guests that are part of a project that I've had a little bit to do with this summer. It's the City Children's Nutcracker Project, and it's a collaboration between the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board and Ballet Arts Minnesota. And I'm really pleased to have with us today um, uh, one of the dancers and teachers, Derek Phillips, Brandon Rouse, and Chana Ure, both of whom are part of the project and uh, learning some dance steps and uh, part of the Nutcracker with Derek's help. So welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thanks for being on the show. It's great. Now, in a minute, we're going to be able to take a look uh, at some of the uh, workshops, some of the classes that you've been leading and that you've been participating in. So we'll get a chance to look at that a little bit. But first, I wanted to ask, what the heck is the City Children's Nutcracker Project? Derek, can you fill <gasps> us in a little bit on what's going on? It's, it's a collaboration between uh, Ballet Arts Minnesota and the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. Um, it's a wonderful idea, but unfortunately, it's not completely original. It was sort of lifted from a similar thing that happened in Houston a number of years ago. Um, one of the members of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board sort of got wind of it or was in Houston at some conference or something. And I'm sorry, I can't remember her name right now. Kathy someone. Kathy Thurber. Thank you. Kathy Thurber. Mm -hmm. uh, and saw this same idea and sort of brought it back here and, and, and copied it. The idea is to basically introduce uh, dance generally, ballet specifically, to inner city kids, uh, if you want to say at-risk kids or, or 
kids of color or whatever, uh, but kids who would not normally be, have any exposure to ballet. Uh, so Ballet Arts Minnesota got together with the Park and Recreation Board to provide classes and then ultimately have this lead up to a performance where kids who took the classes would be involved. Uh, the Nutcracker is one of those annual things that people know about and, and draws a lot of people. So with sort of dangling the carrot of saying, well, hey, you can be in a Nutcracker performance, we give chance, kids a chance to be part of something and to get, get a chance to experience something that they probably normally wouldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the classes, all the classes are free. Um, there's probably a little bit of money involved in terms of costuming and that kind of thing. Uh, it's spread out over a long period of time. We began in the summer with classes at six different parks. Spread throughout Minneapolis? Spread throughout Minneapolis. If I think for a minute, I can tell you all the parks. Martin Luther King, Bethune, Powderhorn, Farview. See, I have to count on my fingers. Um, I'm leaving out two. North, Northeast and Whittier. That's great. It takes a while for me to remember all of them. Um, now we've condensed down, and this is, was the beginning part. That was of the, the summer. summer this series. was the summer. Kids had classes twice a week uh, for a total of six weeks throughout the summer. During that time, they got classes in ballet and modern and creative dance. Hmm. Now we've condensed down to just two sites, Powderhorn and then Farview. And uh, they're getting just more intensive classes in ballet, which will lead them into the performance. Part of these classes will be that they'll learn some of the choreography that they'll actually be performing on stage. And part of your role, you're one of the teachers. My role is, is teaching assistant, which is a, sort of a new role to me. Myself, I've done a lot of work on my own uh, residency work um, in, in schools, uh, s some community work, and some, some stuff in professional studios as well. Uh, and all in modern dance. So this is a double twist for me. Right. I don't have to go in and plan classes. I sort of get to take classes. Right. But my job really is to assist, assist Deidre Kellogg-Rush in sort of being a second eye and sort of adding little corrections and giving little hints and, and being a role model and, and helping to demonstrate uh, some of the ballet movements that the kids are going to be learning. Great. Now, Brandon, had you ever danced before? No. So how did you hear about this, and what made you think, hey, I'm going to go do this? Well, for seven years, I've been doing gymnastics. And I was pretty good at it, except I kept forgetting to like point my toes and stuff. OK. And so my mom had heard about it, and mm -hmm. so I started. And you thought this might work nicely with the gymnastics and things. Mm -hmm. Has the gymnastics helped you in the dance? I mean, I would yeah. think you got some good body control and things like that. Yeah. Are you having a good time doing it? Yes. Fine. Okay. And I think in a minute we're going to look at the tape and we'll probably see you in there. And China, what got you into doing this? Well, um, well, I've been dancing for <clears throat> four years, and um, and just my mom heard about it and she asked if I wanted to be in the Nutcracker. I said yes. So. That sounds like a good thing. Yeah. Why don't we uh, roll that tape right now and then any of you can chime in? Um, but this is something that uh, our crack crew here went out and shot at Powderhorn. I take it you both live down around that way. Uh, yeah. You don't necessarily? Kind of. Okay, but it's the closest one that you want to go to. So when, when it comes up here, um, we'll be able to see it. And why don't you describe for me what it is we're looking at. What you're seeing here is one of a whole slew of exercises, um, all of which are basically designed to uh, strengthen legs. There's our friend Chana with her little straight legs and her big toe that curls up. Um, part of part of the classes too, which Derek trying to correct a little back, um, is 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 about. Um, Oh, what can I say? Style in class. There's that arm correction. Remember that one? Yeah, so I get excited when I see this. Um, but it has to do with um, alignment of the body. Um, things like, for example, the plies that are happening here. We try to keep the back straight so a plie movement isn't a bending over movement, but it's an action of the legs and the knees and has to do with the alignment of things. Um, Chana, I have a yeah. sense you want to say something. <laughs> Me? 
Is it unusual to see yourself? Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't like seeing myself on watch TV. Yourself on video. Yeah. It hurts to watch yourself on video, let now, me tell you. <laughs> have either of you two performed in front of people? I suppose as a gymnast, you've been out in front of yeah. crowds and audiences. How do you feel? Is that Are you comfortable doing that? Sometimes. Sometimes? Sometimes I get a little nervous. A little nervous, yeah. Is this something you think you'll keep doing, Brandon? <coughs> yeah, okay. I think so. Well, here's a question. I know, and this I think is true in a lot of classes. Are there a lot of other boys doing this? No, just me and my brother are the only one. Is that right? At this particular Park. site? At Powderhorn. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we have boys involved in some of the others? Yeah, and in fact, um, early on in the summer when we first started the classes up, the, the, the twice a week, six week uh, sessions that happened, uh, Deidre and I were both really surprised at the number of boys that showed up to take the class. Uh, traditionally, men don't do dance, or if they do get involved in dance, they they get involved later in life. I'm a very good example of that. I didn't start dancing until I was in college. Um, so there's always, for me on a very personal level, there's always a real commitment for trying to get boys at least exposed to dance to let them know that this is one of a lot of other things mm -hmm. that you can do. I've done workshops, for example, that try to get boys involved in dance through a sports angle, mm -hmm. dance and athletics or dance and sports. Uh, this particular program doesn't have that component, but uh, we were really sort of pleasantly surprised by the number of boys that showed up very much on their own and uh, came without a lot of encouragement from, from a parent standing behind them and saying, come on Johnny, let's go, let's go, but came on their own, showed up at the park regularly mm -hmm. on time and stuck with it for most of the six weeks and that's continued as usual We've got more bo more girls mm -hmm. than boys in, in the classes. But we've got some, and we're real pleased. That's we're great. really pleased about that. Now, are both of you hoping and expecting to be part of the uh, the nutcracker itself when it's performed in a month or so? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How does that work? Now, you're obviously in these classes. And those look like pretty serious classes. I mean, they're straightening the legs and getting this. This is not just uh, a casual thing. How will it work for you to get involved in that? Is there a selection process? or? There is a selection process. Uh, it's I would I would venture to say it's sort of informal. Mm -hmm. um, we look at how the, how the kids are looking in class. Mm -hmm. um, as dancers, part of our business is one of reading bodies, yeah. and and bodies tell us a lot. Um, even just from looking at the video, you guys look real good on the video, by the way. Uh, <laughs> just from looking at the video, um, you know we we can tell who is getting the idea. Um, and from that, uh, they'll begin to learn uh, some of the actual choreography that will be performing. Uh, we, we've got a bunch of kids, you know, so that, that will have something to do with the selection yeah, I process. Heard that there could be upwards of 60 young people involved? I mean, that might we've be the upper got, limit. Yeah, we have got about, between the two parks now, the two, the two sites that we're doing right now, we've got almost 80 kids, maybe about 70 That's kids. That's amazing. Yeah, Powderhorn is really huge. I think we're about at 40, and wow. I think at Farview we have That's about a 30. That's a lot. That's a challenge to teach. That's a challenge to teach. That's also part of the reason that I'm assisting mm -hmm. Dietrich. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a big job to mm -hmm. try to get um, what is actually a, a great deal of precision. That's a lot of, a lot of hallmark of, of ballet in particular that involves lots and lots and lots of precision. That precision doesn't come fast, and, and yeah. it also requires a lot of individual attention, which is hard for one teacher well, to I do. Well, I want to ask one of the dancers, Chana, how hard is that? Is this, you know, it, you did look good on the, on the tape there. How hard is that with the instruction? I mean, is it a struggle? Or are you getting mm. it? Uh, not, since this is such a big class, like, I'm not, like, always, um, you know, like, there's so many kids that, that I don't know, like, um, yeah. You uh, work at it. Yeah. Do you, t do you take any homework home? I mean, when you're not in the really. kitchen and you're leaning up against the chair and trying to straighten that leg? Or? Not really. I mean, you know, I show my mom what I do and she mm -hmm. corrects me on stuff. Mm -hmm. But Well, that raises a question, too. How are your parents doing this? Obviously, they are glad you were doing it. Um, they supportive? Um, yeah, they, yeah, they are really. Yeah. Uh, do they help you get there, I suppose? I mean, you probably don't have your own car. Yeah, they, <laughs> they drive me over. They do that. What's, what's the most fun you've gotten out of it so far, Brandon? Anything in particular that you're happy, the happiest with that, that you're getting? Well, it's something to do after school instead of just sitting around watching TV or something. Well, good for you. Yeah. That's great. 
Do you have a, any other arts background yourself uh, besides dance? You mentioned the gymnastics. Any other interest in the arts? Track. Track, okay, yeah. How about yourself? Not really. I've been on like, so well, no, not really. Okay, so this is really kind of a first flavor for both of you in terms of a real art form that you're learning. Yeah. Think you're going to keep it up? Mm-hmm. Okay. I don't, I don't know. Maybe not ballet, but... Yeah, but maybe. Something yeah. Like that. It sounds like, Brandon, you're, you're pretty interested in it. Mm-hmm. Sounds good. Uh, one thing before we leave, we've only got about a minute left. Unfortunately, it keeps going so fast. <laughs> the Dance Theater of Harlem is going to be involved in this. Um, Another part of the project, somehow. again, this was a direct lift from the Houston project, is, is that uh, they will be bringing in uh, principal dancers for the Nutcracker uh, from Dance Theater of Harlem. Uh, that's another thing that touches my heart very closely because it provides another role modeling thing uh, for kids, particularly black kids, particularly African American kids uh, in these two parts. But it, it gives them another thing to look at, another thing to look forward to, uh, seeing, seeing uh, people of color doing ballet. Uh, and they'll be on stage with them. Mm-hmm. You know, it won't be a very separate thing where the kids are just sitting and watching, but they'll, they'll be backstage with these people and seeing what professional dancers from another place, from a company that's toured internationally now, yeah. um, do to get ready for a performance. It's pretty good thing to have on the resume at your age is, you know, performed with. It's a good thing to have on my resume. <laughs> <laughs> and you get to say you dance with Derek Phillips, too. So that's great. I want to thank you all for being here. Best of luck. Oh. Um, when are the performances? We've got it in, what, mid-December? I have to think now because I don't have my calendar in front December of me. December 11th and 12th. Friday and Saturday, a total of four performances. The Friday performance, there's a 10.30 show. I hope someone corrects me on this. There's a 10.30 show and then an evening show at 7.30, and I think on Saturday we do a 2 o'clock matinee and then a 7.30. It might be 7 o'clock. Show. I believe that the 10:30 Friday show is a school performances yeah. where we've sold out for a lot of uh, a lot of school groups coming right. in. And this is all happening at Northrop Auditorium. At Northrop Auditorium. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wish I had the number, et cetera, available for tickets and all that other stuff. I don't have that. We'll get in our calendar. Dogs. Good. We'll give people a chance to call in. So thanks, Chana, Brandon. Thank you very much, Derek. Thanks. Glad to have you on the show. And uh, if you have questions about anything you've heard or seen on today's show, including the City Children's Nutcracker Project. Please call the City Cable Hotline. You'll see it on your screen, 673-2234, and we can get you all that information That. So I'm Phil Lindsay. Thanks for watching, and please stay tuned for a short calendar of events going on here in Minneapolis.